Hi everyone, welcome to SCG's Hub. I am Julie Owens and I'm the CEO here at Social Enterprise Greenhouse and we are so excited to welcome all of our candidates and all of our guests for this very exciting conversation tonight. Uh, for those who don't know SEG, we are one of the state's leading engines of inclusive entrepreneurship. We provide founders and business owners who too often face barriers that more traditional entrepreneurs don't face with access to support, network, networks, and capital to turn their ideas into ventures, their ventures into businesses, and their businesses into economic engines for their communities. SEG has a presence that extends far beyond this hub here in Providence. We have programs in Newport, in Woonsocket, Central Falls, and our alumni have businesses in every corner of Rhode Island. Tonight's forum is made possible because of the great partnerships we have with other organizations here in Rhode Island, and I'd like to acknowledge their leaders here tonight. Lisa Wranglin from Reba. Oscar Mejias from the Hispanic Chamber. Lisa Rayola from Hope in Maine. And Shanavi Che from Center for Southeast Asians and her colleagues Pin and Kanika are here tonight. And I just have to say how appreciative I am of the support that all of you have provided for me as I've stepped into this new role at SEG. I'm so thrilled to be able to call you not only colleagues, but friends, so thank you. Um, and I want to thank the candidates who are here tonight. I know you are all very, very busy um, as, as you are traversing, uh, traversing the state. So we're really grateful that you can be here with us tonight to talk about the economy and entrepreneurship. Um, Congress plays a vital role in shaping local economic development and organizations like all of ours rely on federal funding um, and we help steer federal dollars towards the programs, training, and resources that we know support job creation. So tonight we're going to focus specifically on entrepreneurship and economic development, particularly how those topics impact underserved communities and founders who historically have faced barriers. So we're all excited to hear from each of you and learn more about your priorities in those areas. Uh, as you continue your campaigns, I invite you all to spend more time getting to know our, all of our organizations, and I'd be happy to give you tours here at SG. So let's get things started. I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Lisa Ranklin from Reba. today, you all are seeing me with glasses, um, so that's a treat, I got that um, allergies is, is really super bad, but Reba, we go by Reba, Rhode Island Black Business Association, and we're an organization, it's been around for almost 14 years, and we are here to really help black and brown businesses really grow and thrive, and we know when businesses are growing and thrive, they actually impact real people, real people, real families, and we know when everyone is thriving, we have a direct impact on the state's economy. It's really a win-win for all of us. So a little bit about um, tonight's forum. Of course, you all are not here to listen to me, but I want to set the stage in terms of how we're going to execute tonight, specifically around tonight's discussion. As we know, voters have many choices. There's a lot of people on the stage. Um, and we want to ensure that we're giving the candidates Thanks. 
use my big outdoor voice. Outdoor voice? Okay. They can't hear me, but that never happens. <laughs> all right. You all heard that I am Miss Lisa Ramblin from Rhode Island Black Business Association. Tonight's discussion is really important to voters to decide who is going to, um, who are they going to support in this special election. And we know we have lots of candidates. Thank you all so much for stepping forward and put your name in the ring to say, I want to be the next leader, congressperson from CD1. You all did this. It's tough to put yourself out there and put your family to say, I'm going to do this. And I'm doing this because I really want to drive change, not just on the national stage, but for Rhode Island. And we are super grateful that you all you know, took the time to do so. A couple of things about tonight. We want to ensure that you all are able to share your platform. We want to give voters a choice. Again, there's 10 amazing people up here. And we know that one of you will be selected or voted in to serve CD1. And we know that 10 of you are not going to go to Washington. Only one of you will go there. So we're going to ask you, don't run away from us when the election is over. All of the incredible organization that's here that's pulled us together, we can leverage your talent and your skills. So we know 10 people are 20 or 50, how many of the crazy number is. Uh, will not go to Washington, only one person, so make sure that um, you all are staying on, on, on point. And for many of you that know me, I don't necessarily stay on script. I love to freestyle, so Mike, I see you over there. Um, but tonight's discussion is intended to give voters an insight on each of the candidates. Look at them, they're amazing, they're all well-dressed. And we're going to focus tonight on the economy. We're going to focus on job creation opportunities. What will you do if you're lucky enough to win this election? We're going to ask you kindly no attacks on each other, because you all are amazing. So be nice, be polite, and don't talk over each other. Um, and no much opinion. I added that to the discussion. <laughs> Just be good. Julie and I will really spend some time and ask a question today. We have a series of questions that we'll go through. And we want to ensure that everyone fully spend the time and you get two minutes. Each person, again, you're seated in this order. It was not, you didn't just show up here. We actually, the team actually used a, a nice tool to actually decide how you're going to execute on the question, how you're going to answer the questions, right? We want to make sure that each candidate has the opportunity to respond. So audience, please, no clapping. And please don't say anything not so nice around any of the candidates. If it's not your candidates, OK. We want to hear from all the candidates. So we encourage you to make sure that you are um, staying on course. Again, the tool that was used is called random.org. Random.org that was used to select the candidates by order. And then we'll have a couple of things, a rapid question um, for the candidates, and we'll do a trivia towards the end of the program. But we don't want it to be stiff. We want to be able to give voters a choice to hear from the candidates in their own words. It just feels so stiff in here for me. We want to give um, voters a chance to hear from the candidates so they can make the right decision. Um, and candidates, again, you'll have two minutes to answer to each of the questions, right, as I noted. And then we're going to present the candidates to you. Of course, it is my pleasure to introduce the candidates to all of you. All right, they're on stage. And full disclosure, I am Jamaican, so I go off script all the time. So if you give me a script and you expect me to be on it, I'm going to make you quite uneasy because I never stay on script, but it's all good. <laughs> so let 
me introduce the candidates to you, going from this corner way down to Mr. Aaron, way down at the end. So we have Gabe, Gabe, Gabe Olive, Stephanie, Stephanie, Stephanie Beauty. Beauty, right? Is that how you said? Awesome. Walter Burbick, that's how, where is he? You're there. Sandra Kano. We have Stephen Casey. I saw him down there somewhere. Sorry. Sabina Matos. You're there. Anna Pizzella. Pizzato. Thank you. Aaron Regenberg. And John Gonzalez. There you are. Oh. I Sorry, I missed you, but you wouldn't let that go, right? <laughs> Don Carson. <laughs> Again, thank you all for being here, and Julie is going to kick it off um, this discussion with her first question. Um, and then you're going to hear again, remember, just two minutes, and again, no mudslinging, be nice to each other, because each of you are a superstar. You've stepped up to lead, and we're grateful, so keep it clean. Thank you. Okay, everyone, here we go. Kevin over here has some time cards just to kind of keep everyone on track, so remember you have two minutes each. Um, and again, the candidate order has been randomly decided, so I'll, I'll tee you up when it's time for you. Um, okay, so question number one is, are organizations together provide support to businesses, founders, and entrepreneurs who are traditionally overlooked. The businesses we support play a foundational role to create jobs, opportunities, and wealth in communities that don't often have access to capital. Oftentimes, when politicians talk about economic development, they speak more vocally about big businesses. So, the question. Please describe your view of economic development something specific you have done to foster an environment in Rhode Island that supports entrepreneurship and economic equity and share with us how that specific experience will inform your ability to get things done in Washington for Rhode Island small businesses. And we are going to start with Aaron. Thank you so much to, to everyone, all the incredible organizations and leaders who brought us together today. Uh, you know, there, there's different approaches to economic development and, and job growth, and there's one approach, I think of it as the, the trickle-down approach, right? We need to cut taxes on quote-unquote job creators, and we need to limit protections for workers. And then there's, there's an approach that, that I subscribe to that, that I think of as the fundamentals, right? We need to invest in the fundamentals to build an equitable economy and, and economic growth from the ground up. Uh, and so, you know, we need things like great public education. That's why I spent years organizing with young people in our public schools, uh, fighting to, to win real changes that would in, impact thousands of kids here in Providence. Uh, we, need, uh, we need things like a fair and equitable tax system, you know, not a system that ask small businesses and working people to shoulder the whole burden while massive corporations pay effectively zero in federal income taxes. That's why in the state legislature, I led fights to, to try to um, ask our wealthiest folks to pay their fair share, uh, to close the carried interest loophole, uh, led a fight to block an attempt to lower the estate tax, which would have left small businesses and, and workers to foot the bill. Uh, we need to get energy costs under control and, and have a clean energy transition in ways that are equitable. That's why in the legislature I led fights to create community solar programs that would open up the benefits of clean energy to working people, to renters, people who didn't own a house. Uh, and you know, we need to support workers who want to transition to entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurialism. When I was in the legislature, Benny's closed. It was a catastrophic moment for, for so many of us, right? There were workers at Benny's who wanted to take over the business and let it not uh, disappear. But we didn't have the structures to allow that. I, I worked with those workers to introduce legislation that would have allowed folks to, to come together and try to continue a uh, business before it closes. Um, and those are the kind of programs that I think we need, we need more of. Thank you. Next, Walter. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, you know, as the son of a cooking cashier, I, I grew up 
washing dishes and uh, waiting tables at my family's restaurant. So uh, I understand, you know, how hard it is to grow a small business, open a small business. Uh, and for me, it's it boils down to two issues. I think there are two big barriers that are uh, preventing us from growing uh, here in Rhode Island, but also across the country. And it comes down to gender, and it comes down to race. And the first one on gender, I think it's, 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 it comes down to equal pay uh, for equal work. And so when women succeed, our families succeed, our communities succeed, and our country succeeds. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, women today are you know, still uh, earn 15% less than men doing the same exact work. Uh, and we're not closing that gap uh, you know, quick enough. And this is a, a problem that's going on for generations. Uh, and so if we're serious about growing our small businesses, our middle class, our economy, then women need to get paid equal pay for equal work. Uh, and that's why at the Naval War College, I worked alongside my peers on the faculty advisory committee to, spe uh, to spearhead uh, new initiatives to remove barriers so that women faculty get the same opportunities. Now, the other thing is on systemic racism. You know, that, uh, it's creating disparities in wealth and income, and the fact of the matter is uh, women and women of color uh, are, are, are most pronounced. And, you know, it's a fact that black women have, uh, you know, they, they earn less, they have more student debt, and, you know, they are three times more likely to die in childbirth. And this is just disturbing. And, and that's why in Congress I'm gonna push forward Number one, making sure that uh, women and women of color have access to capital uh, so that they can start and grow their own small businesses. Uh, and number two, so that they can build generational wealth and own their own homes. Thank you. Next is Stephanie. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I think the question was discuss what you've done for entrepreneurship and economic uh, equity. And so after my Secretary of State race, uh, a lot of that conversation was really geared towards small businesses. And I did something that I called a Small Business Saturday. And I would literally go around the state meeting with local small businesses to talk about their pain points, uh, to talk about what are some of the barriers that they're facing while they're operating their small business. And one of them was talking about access to capital. And so after hearing that kind of being a, a redundant um, topic point, I actually met with Stephen Pryor and had coffee since he was kind of the head of the Chamber of Commerce uh, pr uh, prior to his run and talked about what were some of the blockers in order to get that capital into the hands of small businesses. And so um, he was fortunate enough to share with me a lot of uh, pertinent research. And I took that research and talked to a lot of the other um, minority-owned businesses and talked about what their experiences were like with the Chamber of Commerce and how to kind of get uh, access to that as well. And to be quite honest, I think that there's been a roadblock. Uh, the system doesn't necessarily work here in Rhode Island. The funnel isn't uh, pure in the sense of when we say trickle down, it doesn't get to the small business owners. Uh, they don't have access to resources when it comes to marketing and advertising, uh, being able to find a decent accountant so that way your tax books are correct. So I think my plan for Congress is really investing, especially in these um, local community organizations that really provide those hubs and supports, so that way they have that access and resources, like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, like Rebo, so that way they can get to those local uh, communities that they already are on the ground and have a relationship with, and not provide them with loans, but I really think with grants. I think that that's the biggest thing. I want to make sure that you're able to uh, elevate and be a startup hub here in Rhode Island, the same way that we have that in Massachusetts. And I think that that comes with uh, vision and initiative. Thank you. Next is Don. Hi. It's good to be with this crowd tonight. I feel like I'm with my people. I, uh, a room full of entrepreneurs is a friendly place for me, so I'm happy to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you very much for organizing it. You know, there are many different kinds of capital, and um, I think one kind of capital that's really important would be grants or you know, sometimes equity ownership in a business. Another kind is credit where you, get, you do get loans. Credit is the lifeblood of most businesses, and I've run a lot of businesses and know how important credit is. Lisa and I talked about this just the other night, because she's been a lender at pretty much every major bank in Rhode Island, which is pretty impressive, and understands the importance of credit. And the third thing is really skills, human capital. And I think that's where Rhode Island is really lagging, is in investing in the kinds of entrepreneurial skills, startup skills, business management skills, accounting skills, and uh, really entrepreneurship skills more generally that, that people often lack when they apply for credit. 
And that winds up being the biggest obstacle, um, is, is that people don't have the ability to show that they can use the money wisely and well. And those are, that's a really important gap to fill. Um, when I was working in Congress back earlier in my career, I worked five years in the institution that we're all running to, to work in right now, the House of Representatives. We passed some meaningful legislation called the Community Reinvestment Act. And what we did was to take that act and make it actionable by building it into the bank examination process so that banks were held accountable for how much money they lend into small businesses and they lend into disinvested communities. That's one of the most effective tools the federal government has ever created to drive capital into communities that are starved for capital in that way. So I think those are some of the things that we can do to drive skills, to build human capital, as well as to get uh, money capital, that is equity and credit, into small neighborhoods. I spent the last 25 years building businesses. So I've been at a thousand pitch competitions and read a thousand pitches and a thousand funding summaries. So I know how this stuff works, and I think we can make it work a whole lot better in Rhode Island. Thank you. John. Great. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for such a substantive discussion. I just want to start off by affirming the people who do this work every single day. So if we can just give them a round of applause. Really um, so the, the question is what we've done, and I'm really proud of my track record at the local level. So in Ward 1, and I like to remind people of this, we are the fastest growing district not only in the city but in the state of Rhode Island. So we have over 600,000 uh, square feet of commercial space. We are building out our wet lab infrastructure, working with partners like Brown University. We have a lot of private sector jobs and growth that's coming to the district. We're right here in it. We've got over 1,000 plus residential units coming online over the next couple of fiscal years, and that's my track record at the local level. We also have been able to secure critical grants working with our federal government. So 5.1 million in streetscape improvements right here in Ward 1, and that's the kind of leadership that I would bring at the federal level. On the local level, this is also something that's critically important and also connected to my background. I'm an educator. So when we talk about the stark income inequality that we're experiencing in our state, it starts with education. We need skills, we need jobs, we need vocational training, and that's going to help people get a leg up. I really appreciate some of the comments that were made by some of my colleagues on this stage to discuss the vast economic and racial inequalities that we're experiencing as a state. If we don't address those issues head on, we are going to be in the exact same place that we started. And so that means investing, mentoring, it means financing our small businesses, it means bringing resources back to our community, and that's exactly what I would do should you elect me to be your next congressperson. Thank you. Sandra. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is what I do for a living, so I'm going to tell you exactly a specific example. In 2011, I got hired for a local credit union in Central Falls, and that was the same year that the city of Central Falls uh, was able to um, do bankruptcy. And due to that, the small business community was not only discouraged, but it was really hit hard with high taxes. At that time, not only I analyzed it a strategic plan to help the small business community, but I created a opportunity for them to organize, have a small business owners and read three things. Resources, education opportunities, and networking opportunities so they can get to know each other. With that, I was able to bring partnerships around the state with organizations that are here today to teach them and to meet them where they needed to be. And two things that were very important. We not only asked them to organize, but we went to where they were. Because as business owners in Central Coast, they needed to have one-on-one -on -one technical assistance at their places where they were. We applied for grants together. We were able to understand their needs. And lastly, I was able to change the mentality that there was um, uh, uh, in the terminology of the financial institution, they were called underserved. And the way that they were feeling when they were called underserved was really, really badly. And then so we did a, a good work, and then we changed the perception and the label, and we changed it for emerging markets. And I'm very proud to not only say that it wasn't a hand out, but it was a hit out. 
And what we did with that was not only change and bring product to the community, bring resources, opportunities for them to grow, but also at the state level, I brought that experience and in the SBA Economic Summit, I was the co-chair and we changed it at the SBA and now it is called the emerging markets instead of the underserved communities. Those things matter. And then now at the state level, legislatively, I've been able to do those policies that work because I understand the needs firsthand because I know how they are. And they talk to me and I'm back with them hand in hand throughout the years. So thank you. Thank you. Gabe. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, as a son of a small business owner, uh, I'm grateful that we are having this conversation. Uh, before I returned uh, to, before I return to the White House, I worked for Governor Raimondo here in Rhode Island, and I'm sure many of you know a core component of uh, her agenda was was the economic development agenda. And as her director of community affairs and public engagement, I spent a lot of time advocating for a robust set of investments in our uh, small businesses, right? The small first small business assistance fund that came from the state that was during her tenure the network matching grant to help so many of the incubators uh, of, of businesses in, in specific uh, industries. Uh, that was during her tenure. Certainly the, uh, the innovation voucher to help those who were just getting their, their innovative companies off the ground, uh, the, the boost that they need to, to thrive. And so during that time, I spent a lot of time on the road speaking with small business leaders, speaking with people who were going to be beneficiaries of this and bringing back those findings, working very closely with the, the then Secretary of Commerce. But fast forward to just a few years ago when I was working for President Biden at the White House, one of the big pieces of legislation that came through in the first year uh, was the American Rescue Plan and $350 billion that went to states, cities, county governments across the country for them to come back from the COVID-19 pandemic, but also invest in their people, invest in their places. And uh, a lot of the best practices that we cited in, in my relationships with, with governors and mayors across the country were those investments to help small businesses to both build out the skills that, that folks needed to be able to thrive, paying for things like training, but also just the, the nuts and bolts uh, that the folks needed to get through. And that's something I'm very proud of, and I'm hopeful that we have the opportunity uh, to expand upon that in Congress. Thank you. Stephen. Thank you. Uh, for the past few years, I've worked with the Woonsocket Downtown Collaborative um, as a group that we basically promote our, all of our downtown uh, small businesses. We try to promote uh, young, new businesses moving in. Uh, for me, it's been uh, a, a great pleasure to, to help small businesses navigate starting a business and understanding the, the factors and things that, that they, uh, the, the challenges that they face. Uh, one of those things, especially during COVID, was helping them try to stay open. And with a lot of businesses utilized the PPP money that was offered by the state. Uh, and then the state turned around and tried to tax them on the PPP money, which I thought was very fair, and we stood up against that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the business community has been very supportive of me. Um, as chair of the Health and Human Services, I work closely with the state health, health exchange to help uh, sole proprietors and people who are going to start businesses to find legitimate answers and easy ways to obtain quality, affordable, sometimes free health care. Um, and as the chairman as well, um, I've legislated for uh, legislation to help create, create changes in our system that provide very, very, uh, I would say, beneficial patient outcomes. That's the key to everything that we've done. It's all been about patient outcomes, and we basically uh, work with the providers to make sure that they understand that these are the goals that we're looking, working forward, uh, going to. But I think addressing income inequality is one of the issues that we need to face when we're talking about um, businesses and startups. We have an extreme problem with income inequality. It starts at a young age, and the the, uh, the performance gaps between students um, that that have uh, are in underserved communities. I think that those gaps start to spread, and there's no way to we haven't been able to close those gaps. And I think what we need to do is offer high quality education for everybody, uh, starting at a very early age. And I think the other part of the other part of uh, the problem is that we've had an increase in cost as far as rate, borrowing rates, and those are the things that people rely on to start their business. Thank, Thank you. you. Sabina. Thank you. 
Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I was trying to make a list, hopefully, to get to all of them before my time is up. But I have had the opportunity to work with each one of the organizations that have put this forum together since the beginning. Uh, since I've been in the local government in the Providence City Council, I saw when SGE, um, SEG was starting, I saw uh, the work of RIVA and the work every time that RIVA came to the Providence City Council um, in advocating and supporting the work that RIVA was doing. Working with Lisa and Hope in Maine, and working with Shanavi at the Center for Southeast Asia, making sure that we are providing resources to those organizations that most of the time don't get the funding and the attention that they need. Um, if I go through the beginning of the work that I, that I have been done in the Providence City Council, one of the first things that I did was to allocate funding for technical assistance for the small business community in Oneville. And the way how I did this was uh, sending the funding to the Center for Women and Enterprise. So, and then after going with then director, um, uh, um, Carmen Diaz-Susino, door knock every business in Oneville to let them know this funding is available, this resource is available for you. Because most of the businesses cannot afford to leave um, to, in order to find out that information. Um, if I go um, a little bit more um, recent, during the pandemic, I partnered with the Providence Revolving Fund. Uh, they had an amazing plan. I'm sorry, did I see what was for the time? 30 seconds. Uh, well, I have to run this up. <laughs> So I partnered with the center, uh, with the uh, Providence Revolving Fund. I allocated uh, $100,000 to match them so they could provide resources for the small business community. I have worked with the Entrepreneurship Challenge. I have been um, the chair of the Small Business Advocacy, Advocacy Council working with the SBA. Sorry, I'm not. It's okay, thank you. And Anna. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for putting this together for us. As a big business owner myself, I was many years ago, I know the struggle the business go on, especially when you're trying to find funds. And most of the business, especially in my district, they go through private loan to be able to start their business. That's very, very bad because they, have, they pay very high tax, uh, high raise uh, for the money they get. One of the things is we cannot forget, small business is the backbone of our economy. And we need to provide the service and, the, and, and bring resources for them to be able to open a business, to help them to open the business, to educate them how to put a business plan together, how to find those funds, how to reduce taxes for them. And, and, and the only way to do that is bringing more resources. But at the same time, we cannot forget people who don't speak the language, who many times have problems to be able to apply for loans, for grants, then they make it so difficult too because the paperwork is so much and that's the first thing we need to reduce the paperwork that they have to fill up, all the information, all the things that they have to provide to qualify for those loans. And see, we help them reducing that I think we're going to be more success and we're going to be able to help more and more business to open business, to be able to collaborate with them uh, on how to work, how to keep it, because they are the one who bring jobs to our economic, they bring uh, taxes, they are the one who pay more taxes, and we need to work with them to help them to reduce a lot of the, um, the well, I will stop there, but uh, I really say thank we need to work and bring more resources to our more business in Thank you. Thank you. We are on to question two. All right. Question two. It's it's long. It's a long one. Uh, our organization support businesses that play a critical role in creating creating jobs, opportunities, and generational wealth. Black and brown owned businesses face clear, documented barriers as it relates to access to capital and growth. Too often these businesses are left behind in Rhode Island. This is a real this has a real impact 
and many of you in this room know this very well, did you know that less than 1% of employee firms in Rhode Island have one or more employee in Rhode Island and they're black owned? Did you know that? That equates to less than 400 businesses. The Brookett Institute um, did a, a study recently, um, and many of you in this room probably read it. If black-owned accounted for 8.9% of all Rhode Island businesses, guess list to this one, we would have 2,700 additional black-owned firms. And more importantly, those businesses would actually create 56,000 jobs. Let that sink in for a moment. So black-owned firms are less than 400 with employees, right? Black-owned businesses often struggle, I mean, we heard of that from the candidates, to get loans from traditional lending institution. And in many cases, um, you know, they look for microloans through SBA programs, and also going out to folks that are charging them way too much money, we know that. But Congress actually did something really great back in 77. They actually created the Community Reinvestment Act. And I know many of you know it's a federal um, program that really was designed to support small businesses. That program we know is not working really well. I added that into the. I'm a banker, I know. Also, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that many large firms were able to take advantage of the PPP. And smaller firms disproportionately were shut out of access in the PPP. I'm gonna let that sit in for a moment. You also know that not just black owned firms, but minority firms, when they actually go into banks, they're not actually get assistant with um, filling out applications for a loan. There's the barriers is stacked super high. As a Congress person, could you share specifically how would you advocate or champion programs that create access to capital for small businesses, entrepreneurs, and what legislation would you actually champion to create successful black minority and women-owned firms? I'm gonna start with Sabina. Thank you. Give me an opportunity to finish my list. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, this is a very important question and I know we addressed this before on other forums about the importance of making sure that the Community Reinvestment Act is working for um, the black and brown communities, for the minority communities, in the, and making sure to make the banks and the financial institutions more accountable for equity and how they uh, implement uh, the, the Act. One of the things that I have noticed is the challenge that our community has to access some of the programs that we already have available. I remember trying to help a business that was um, in a financial challenge. They only had um, a gap for the winter. And they couldn't get access to capital soon enough. By the time they got the funding through the city um, at that time, uh, Providence Revolving Loan, the loan that has several names, as we all remember. By the time that that was processed, it was too late for them. What I will be investing on is a type of program that which I tried to create at the local level in Providence that would provide us a type of uh, access to capital, looking like an equity line of credit targeted specifically to the minority community. As long as they are enrolled in a plan to build the capacity and to make sure that they're able to prepare um, their books and learn how to run their business because as you know, we have had this conversation for quite some time and we've been trying to establish an organization that's gonna help the, the small businesses get ready. That's why I was so happy to support the um, Skills for Rhode Island Fishers um, Business Hub because that's what we're trying to do. We have been talking about this for a long time and finally it's happening. How we can protect 
uh, help the small businesses get ready and be, be as strong as. We're gonna go to Stephanie and then Dave. So um, one of the biggest barriers I think is, a lot of the candidates kind of touched upon it, is being able to access capital, right? Applying for a loan, that's a barrier. If it's a language, then that's also a barrier. But then even applying for a grant, if you don't uh, have a grant writer on your staff, you're also uh, inhibited from being able to have that access. And one of the things that I thought was quite unique in this regard is that uh, one of the military budgets is kind of like the most expensive that's actually been passed in Congress. Uh, Senator Reid and Senator Whitehouse actually had a grant for Polaris MEP and I was there really trying to understand uh, what that military funding and how that was going to be allocated as resources uh, in Rhode Island. And it was a grant that they gave to a particular uh, company to serve as a hub to support other small businesses but in tech and in military. And I don't see why that can't be the same for black and brown businesses, that we have the same type of billions of dollars of investment, which is what was brought in here in Rhode Island for Polaris, uh, to have that be allocated towards our black and brown businesses. And that is one of the biggest commitments uh, that I will make because my grandmother owned her own small business and she was able to provide for her five kids with that. And she honestly didn't get a loan from banks. It was the community that gave dollars in order for her to be able to start her own company. And then she reinvested it by hiring those same people in those communities to be able to start their own micro businesses. And that's something that we can kind of replicate here, but creating grant access and making sure that we have uh, staff to help provide and provide those resources so that way that that itself doesn't become a barrier in my office is one of the biggest things that I intend to champion. Okay. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I, I think on the Community Reinvestment Act, I think broadening uh, the set of institutions uh, that are, are, are subject to, to the requirements, including uh, credit unions, uh, would provide more venues uh, for folks to seek assistance uh, as, as they need. Uh, but I, I think there's a broader uh, approach that I would take regarding partnerships. Um, you know, I think when we look at access to capital, there's a separate uh, uh, category of of support that's needed around capital readiness and building up more programs, working uh, collaboratively with organizations like some of those represented in, in this room to make sure that businesses are prepared uh, to be in receipt of, 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 of capital and to also be able to navigate uh, some of the, the, the trials that lie ahead in, in business. You know, as a son of a small business owner, I know when there have been seasons where things haven't gone well. And being able to navigate some of those uh, and having some, some experience, having simulated some of the situations you may go through, I think is, is particularly important. But I, I do think a more robust set of partnerships, we've got a sort of puzzle of federal agencies that are involved with small businesses. And I do think uh, centralizing some of, of the resources to create more of a roadmap uh, for how your business can be supported uh, with resources externally is something that we should prioritize. And I think legislatively, that's something that you might be able to get some serious buy-in from in a bipartisan basis. I think one thing that's universal is everybody wants businesses to thrive. Everybody wants small businesses to thrive. And that's something that I would be willing and, and very happy to pursue as a congressperson. I'm gonna go with Stephen, Sandra, then Aaron. Thank you. So historically, I guess, and like uh, like you said, Lisa, the system's a little bit broken. Community Reinvestment Act doesn't really work for everybody. I think what we have in Rhode Island and basically in the country is an issue with uh, financial literacy. Rhode Island is one of the only states that does not have a requirement for students to have a financial literacy class before they uh, before they graduate high school. I think this is the basis of the problem. I think part of the uh, part of the solution is also federal federal investment in uh, small business incubators, kind of like what we're doing here. We have one one socket as well as well. I think if we invest in these type of uh, programs all across the country, we can make a better opportunity for the for the underserved. 
and these, you know, this is going to include uh, programs that help a person actually start a business, register with the Secretary of State. Um, these are these are programs that I started my own business. These are programs that we didn't have back when I started. After I started working with the Small Business Administration, I started to understand the the, the great things that they do to help to help businesses. But I think it comes down to, in the end, it all comes down to education. Uh, people need to be well aware of how to financially govern themselves, and that's, this will translate to the businesses uh, as they move forward and start their own businesses. Um, I think also that uh, from the standpoint of the education part, so we start people off on the wrong foot because we don't have an education system that really works from a financial literacy standpoint, and the SBA does have programs, one's called the right foot. Um, we can, this is an opportunity where we provide, they provide seminars to help people learn how to start their own business. I think this is a, a good program that's working. We need to expand on it. And like I said, business incubators across the state, for people who are interested in starting their own business, they can come and learn about it. Thank you. So leadership matters, but representation matters more. And I have done both. And the first thing that I want to do is clarify that there is two pieces of legislation here that have been um, spoken about. So financial literacy was enacted, and that was my bill, and it was passed. So every student in Rhode Island is now um, able to take financial literacy for its schools. Um, I also would like to say that the PPP loans, um, I was a sponsor for them not to be taxable because I heard from the small business community. And it is important that not only we understand the needs, but we actually do it. As a city council woman in Pataki, it was very important for me to advocate for Riva to have the first $15,000, I know it wasn't a lot, but it was $15,000 through CDDG to create a micro program, uh, micro loan program for the small business communities in Pataki for the black owned business owners there. And it was through partnerships that we were able to do that. And a, um, as a professional in the credit union board, I was able to not only do seminars uh, to make sure that the small business owners knew how to access credit and create opportunities for them to close the gap in the financial services so they have the opportunity to have those micro loans. For example, one of the things that the small business community from the um, BIPAP community um, always suffer is that they don't have a high credit score. And then so what we did is we created an alternative. We had the opportunity to have two letters of refer reference from um, people and accountants that are working with them to make sure that they could qualify for this access to capital programs. So it can be work. It could be done. And as a legislator, I also work very closely with Set Magazine Art to create programs so local banks will be able to not only get the money from the state invested in their institutions, so they could do those programs to the local communities and invest in the small business owners. So leadership and representation matter, and knowing the needs of the community really makes it happen. So I, I have done that, and I will continue to do that elected into Congress. Thank you. So our, our current system of, of private for-profit banking has a long history of racism, right? A long history of, through policies both explicit and nowadays more de facto, cutting out communities of color from access to credit and capital. And there are alternative models. The, the state of North Dakota has a public state bank that has written into the bank charter requirements, mandates, about providing capital and credit to uh, local North Dakota farmers and other communities that, that they prioritize. And the bank officers there are democratically accountable for reaching those goals in ways that the Community Reinvestment Act doesn't compare to. So I think we should be pursuing alternative models of public banking that actually require investment, capital, credit uh, to be provided to historically marginalized communities, minority-owned businesses, black-owned businesses. Uh, and I think in Congress we can pursue federal programs to provide federal support uh, to states and localities in setting up and, and getting the initial capital to create those programs. I think there's a lot of other things we need to do too, right? We need to tackle the student loan crisis because we know that there are so many young entrepreneurs, particularly young, young entrepreneurs of color, who are blocked from pursuing their dreams because they're buried under a mountain of student debt, right? We need to pursue antitrust policies like those that David Cicilline has been championing to stop big corporate monopolies from suppressing competition. Uh, from crushing small businesses before they have an opportunity to succeed. And we need to relieve the crushing burden of 
health insurance costs that's borne by small businesses by passing policies like Medicare for All. So I think there's a, there's a lot we can do uh, and we need to be fighting. Thank you. We're going to go to Don, Walter, and John, and then Anna. So sitting up here looking at you all and wanting your votes, it's really tempting to just tell you what you want to hear. And I think that we're, a lot of us are falling prey to that right now. The idea that we can shower you with government money and shower you with grants and shower you with um, free capital to start businesses ain't going to happen. Um, the vast majority of investment in, that goes into building businesses comes from the private sector. And the way to get that money is to become investable. Like, that's one thing I think that Gabe said that I agree with, is that um, you want to be ready to receive that capital and ready to put it to really good use. So what I want to do is take this room full of builders and creators and innovators and teach you how to build an investable business. I see my friend Danny Warshay sitting in the back over there who teaches entrepreneurship at Brown, and his book is called See, Solve, and Scale. See an unmet need figure out a way that's economically viable and a business model that works to solve it, and then find a way to scale it up so it becomes a real business that employs lots of people. That's really good thinking. You can learn those skills, and then you can go into the capital markets and stand on your own two feet without public banking or without a grant from the government and build a credible business that will create great, great returns, great jobs in your neighborhood, and pr provide an income for you and your family. I've done this a lot of times. My own sister started a grooming shop last year. She saw that there was a need for it. Uh, she decided she would figure out a way to do it. She figured if she could find 65 dogs that she could cut on a regular basis for a, on a seven week rotation, she could make a decent living for herself. She can't scale it, but it's a decent living for herself and she set out to do it and she did get a loan from the Small Business Administration once she had a viable business model that she could show them really worked. So that's what I would hope for this room, is that these creators and innovators and builders in this room right here can learn the skills to create a business model that's genuinely investable, where you can, you can attract private capital in to find a way to, to make your dreams come true. Now that might not be that you realize the dream that you set out to have when you were eight years old. It might be a more sophisticated dream and it might be a business model that evolves over time to meet the needs of your community in a way that people really care about and will really pay for. So, you know, growing up in, in my family, small business, um, serving in the Navy, uh, serving in federal service at the highest levels of government in the State Department, Pentagon, uh, and at the Naval War College really taught me a few things. It taught me how to lead with courage and compassion. It taught me how to uh, solve complex problems and uh, to deliver real results. And most importantly, about bringing people together. Uh, to, to work together to come to common ground and come to consensus. Uh, and that's, those are the qualities of a small business owner and those are the qualities of someone that we need uh, in Congress. Uh, one of the things that most folks might not know and that I don't, I don't know to talk about is uh, at the State Department, uh, working for Secretary Kerry, uh, I worked with just an incredible team uh, that spearheaded new climate policies that uh, provided uh, uh, underserved and marginalized communities across uh, in coastal communities across the world with new with new access to grants loans and capital to start up their own small businesses and to grow their small businesses uh, and that's exactly what we need to do here in Rhode Island I mentioned before equal pay for equal work that is a huge problem across our country and that we need to pass legislation and enforce that legislation across that country uh, across our country uh, number two is strengthening the Small Business Administration 504 loan program. We got to do better on that. Uh, and look, what I'm hearing from across folks across our district, uh, especially in the hospitality and restaurant industry, uh, the two biggest issues that are, are impacting them is housing and education. Uh, you know, I mentioned this yesterday, but if we if we uh, didn't build one one ship, uh, and that's the LCS, uh, which is not, which is a low quality ship, uh, we could solve, we can use that money and solve our housing crisis right overnight. And that's what we need to do. John. Thank you for this question. There's a lot of emerging and common threads that I'm hearing here. And I think it's critically important to think about the lenses that we approach this with. You know, as a two-term city councilman, I look at this from the micro level, but also the macro level. 
I think the most critical thing that we can do, and I think we all agree about this, is bringing federal funding back to Rhode Island. But in addition to the funding, we also need accountability. And I can marry the two as a local elected official, similar to Congressman Cicilline, who came from the municipal government and went to uh, federal government. I think what we need to do is focus on Main Street over Wall Street. And when we think about the specific pieces of legislation that I would support, it would be the Raise the Wage Act, for example, or the Paycheck Fairness Act, where people can invest in their local communities, particularly those who are the most marginalized among us. But it's also the Housing and Economic Opportunity Act. And I just want to share why this is critically important at the local level and how it connects to the federal level. At the local level, I've been the lead sponsor on dozens and dozens of pieces of legislation and have also worked to put Main Street and our small businesses first. We received over $166 million in ARPA funds that we were able to inject in our local communities, a $12 million line item to help support small businesses, particularly businesses of color. Uh, through racial equity initiatives. And then it's also pushing folks to be accountable. So if you look at the Superman building, for example, we work to ensure that the developer there uh, in had 20% affordable, low-income housing in addition to 20% MBE jobs. That's the kind of leadership that I'll exhibit, and I think marrying the micro and the macro together is something that your congressperson needs to be able to do, and that's something that I've done at the local level. Anna. Um, a few years ago, we passed a legislation at the state, uh, at the state level, they call it uh, Cooperativa. And that's a, a very well known, especially for people who come from Latin America. They use these cooperativas because they get a, a many business together, who put money together, and then they can invest, uh, help all the business to open their own business. And the way to do that in, in that cooperativa is saying, well, talk it. Um, Central Falls, sorry. And one of the things that they do is they get together, they help each other, and they do it every cleaning company, uh, this one is specific. But it can be anyone. I think we need to create, uh, me being in Washington, one of the first things I do, we need to create a grant specific for women, you know, women of color who started their own business. Um, a few days, uh, uh, like two months ago, I was able to go to one of um, uh, event in my district. And when I went in, I found out like more than 50 single mom who having their own little business, uh, you know, micro business. And it was amazing. They all were looking for capital because they didn't have the money to be able to do the thing. But it was amazing what they do and how they support each other. One person put that together, invited them to come, and everybody was open to share the business in there with other people. And people were able to find out what they do, what kind of product they sell, and how to help each other. And I think that's one of the things that we need to tackle. We need to bring specific uh, for people of color, for women, um, business, because the problem is in education is a main thing. People don't know where to apply. Um, we, we need to reduce uh, how much, uh, you know, like, uh, how much paperwork you have to bring in to qualify for anything. And legal service is another thing that we need to help them to get uh, legal service to get uh, the purpose knowledge before they apply for any of those loans. Thank you all so much. That was awesome. We're going to move to the next phase of our process. We're going to move to the rapid fire question that we're going to start with. Okay. Okay. So this is the lightning round. So these are fast. Okay. So we want quick answers. We're running a little behind, and so we're going to make up some time. Okay. So we're going to start with Aaron, and we're going to work all the way down the line. And the question is: You have a friend visiting from out of state, visiting Rhode Island for the very first time. You're going to bring them one place. It is not a beach. Where do you go? Been spending a lot of time at the 
Providence Children's Museum, which is just a phenomenal place. And it's, uh, it's really fun to, to watch our son Asa travel around and, and just have an amazing time. It's fun for adults to experience that too. Great, thank you. Oh, okay. Well, there's so many places we can bring people in Rhode Island. Even if Rhode Island is the smallest state, we have so many unique To pick one, lay well, around. I would bring it to a nice restaurant to try different places that we have in our state and for them to know how, they use them, how diverse we are. Especially. Thank you. Great. I would bring them to the province, uh, to, the, to the state house here in Providence, to show everybody that Rhode Island was set on, started on religious freedom and acceptance for everybody. Thank you. I would bring them to the Mike Van Leeson Providence Pedestrian Bridge. Okay, I'm going weird with this one. I'm going to bring them to Quonset. Because that's and it's an amazing story of redevelopment and successful real businesses that now employs 20% of the manufacturing in Rhode Island is right at Quonset because of the genius of Steve King and his team that have made sense ready. If you want to understand it, I can explain it, but that's okay. Just kidding. That's okay. I would take them on a nature walk. Um, the Audubon Society has a lot of great ones throughout City One. Since we're talking about entrepreneurship and small business, so I will take them to Hope and Maine and see how new immigrants are able to create business and build new life there. I actually bring them to two places. You only get one. A school in Central Falls and a school in Barrington, so they can see the disparity in education. Okay, that, that's fair. I will take them to Slater Mill as a proper take first run. Slater Mill is the place to go. Uh, I'd take them to one of our vibrant main streets, but I'm going to pick one and just pick uh, Main Street and Warren. Thank you very much. Okay, Lisa. All right, so listen carefully. What was the most recent black or brown owned retail business or restaurant you shopped at or ate at? And what did you eat or what did you buy? Uh, we're going to start with Gabe. Uh, I had two days ago uh, food at the Village Restaurant uh, in downtown Providence, uh, Nigerian uh, style West African cuisine. Have you been? Oh, I, I had uh, rice and beans and a spinach uh, dish. <laughs> so, Ten Rocks in Pataka is amazing and I got the octopus and also the chicken and pineapple um, that they have. So, so good. This is easy for me because I go here like three times a week and uh, that's incredible in East Providence uh, by Sterling and Russell. Uh, Jamaican, the Jamaican Bowl's absolute fire, so check that out. So I was saying to eat, um love eating so to eat at Sarah so single pool noodles are always my to go to and for shop I just went to uh, Jerry's Bluffing Boutique in one socket and got a hat for especially when I go to one of the Nigerians events so I can have my hat for the Nigerians so Jerry just took my money too right so uh place that I go to, it's actually every Sunday, me and my daughter go there for breakfast, uh, the Hummingbird, it's in Newport, uh, they have an amazing brunch, and their lunch is amazing, I tried their pork special, and my favorite is Oxtail, but we won't go there. Uh, shopping was obviously Jerry Bluffing's boutique, because she gets yeah. <laughs> Hummingbird is pretty awesome, I have to, I have to say I love that one too. Um, beautiful day. I've fallen in love with their granola. Cardamom and ginger and all kinds of amazing flavors in their granola. It's amazing and it's owned and run by refugees. It's an amazing business. So Ken downtown and I actually, Danny Warshale also acknowledge you as well. I encouraged uh, Brown University to support a local business and they did a, a little workshop there and supported that local business and I had the opportunity to dabble in that. Tacos Jalisco, Social Street, One Socket. We've all been running around campaigning, and we got to stop quick. Beef burrito is the best way to go. 
Well, I love a restaurant in Central Falls called Shark, and I was there not that long ago, and I had a ceviche. Most recent for me was Paimonti Pizza and Grill. It's on the corner of Camp and Doyle. It's owned by this the loveliest Kurdish family. And a little tip is what I had. It's not on the menu, but ask for the Kurdish pizza, and it's this really, really delicious melange of flavors that, that you've never had before. It's amazing. Excellent. Okay, everyone. So we're going to mix it up and start in the middle and go down this way. So I'm going to start with Sabina for this next one. Um, and again, remember, this is the lightning round, so we don't want more than a, a sentence. I'm saying that to everyone. No. Okay, single largest barrier to growing the small business economy in Rhode Island. We talk about it, access to capital. Knowledge, so having the resources to have someone who has that skill set. Those are both clearly right. I'm going to say that the state is just not friendly to business. And I think it's well known around the world that we're not friendly to business. 45th out of 50, not something to be proud of. As a teacher, I'm going to say education. And coupled with that is housing. I think low and moderate income housing is the problem. Um, companies are looking for employees to move into town and they cannot afford to live here. Well, I cannot agree more with what I heard, but education would be my priority. These are all right. Uh, to add a, a different one, I think the cost of living crisis is impacting small businesses in a lot of ways. Okay, and then back to game. I think it's a product of all these other things, but the brain drain that is persistent to keep people here with the energy to build and join existing businesses. So I agree with all my colleagues here, but I think the most challenging part is the red tape and then the state and municipalities do not work together to help the small businesses. It's crazy. They don't talk to each other. Make sure. I think it's leadership. I think it's failed leadership. Uh, the failure of people to come together uh, and realize that there is more that unites us that divides us and that we need to work together to solve these problems. Thank you. Back to Lisa. All right. So listen carefully. Um, nationally, what percentage of venture dollars do you believe go to black-owned ventures and what percentage go to women-owned ventures? What percentage of dollars goes to black owned firm or women owned firm? Percentage. Who wants for to any, start? Is for anybody to jump in? Go ahead, John. Um, I, don't, I don't know if this is entirely accurate, but uh, I think women startups receive less than 2% of venture capital funds. Is that correct? I'm, and that's, we want to do like a price is right round that, everybody. That, that, that's solely. Everybody, uh, venture, make, everybody make their yes. So, yeah. Solely venture capital. So I yeah. just want to share that. Stephen. I don't know the exact figure. I'm going to make an assumption that combined it's less than 5%. Anna. Yeah. Not know the answer because if we come here thinking that we know everything, we'll be wrong. Then I will go with two or three percent. Three percent. All right. Yeah, I, I would guess two or three percent, and I think that shows that there are structural systemic issues here. Uh, I'd probably say less than two percent on both. Yeah, less than three percent. Price is right, and I've heard five. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go 4.9, but in all honesty, and, the all, and all joking aside, it's way too low. All right, I'm gonna go combine at 8%. So I think it's 1% for. Uh, one percent for black women, and then for women, um, thinking of white women, when I put that in the, the number, it's going to be like fourteen percent. Um, 
Denture is notoriously racist and sexist, and the big dollars go to white boys, for sure. So I'm going to go less than 1% combined. The answer is black-owned firm receive 2% goes to black firm, and 3% go to women. Combined five. <laughs> It's also white boys in our politics, too, so I just want to think that's important. Well, thank you, everyone. That, that, um, it's, it's, it is. It's, yeah, we're trying to do a little trivia here, too. Um, okay, so next question is, and let's see, we're going to start with John this time, and we're going to come this way, and then kick it back to Aaron. So name a small business owner who would be part of your kitchen cabin. Okay, so... I'm at the local level, so I work with small businesses every single day, and I have conversations with them every single day. That being said, I would say, this is a real case study, the I Street businesses that I work with, and I know that's, that's not a specific business, but we work together collectively to improve that Main Street corridor, and uh, so I Street businesses. Okay. So um, there's a little company called Flux Marine in Bristol, run by a CEO named Ben. They're making electric outboard engines, and they're one of the few genuinely sustainable, progressive, innovative businesses I've found in Rhode Island to try to feature. I put them on my kitchen cabinet. I go with uh, Jerry. Uh, so I say his first name because a lot of people know him in the community who had a lot of different barriers to be able to own his own hair salon and then open a restaurant, he's a librarian, uh, on Federal Hill, that itself was a barrier. And so having someone who's overcome those challenges and who knows how to work with grit um, would be someone in my cabinet. I like the experience of the retail shop, so probably we'll have a Jerry from Jerry's Law Firm Boutique, and it's just because I like her style, so. Mine was the male Jerry, with a J. Yeah, no. Different Jerry. <laughs> I, uh, I mentioned Sterling and Russell from Incredible earlier for food, but I put them on my cabinet because they are the true American story. Uh, went from a food truck to a brick and mortar, and they are doing absolute great work. Not only is the food amazing, but they're doing great work for the community. So I done that. I was a small business owner in Central Falls. I own a restaurant. And in my cabinet is my support system, so my parents were my cabinet, and also the organizations that really supported me, such as the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which I was a co-founder, so the same too. Um, one, I, I would get in trouble uh, if I didn't say my dad. Um, but, but he's in CD2, so uh, CD1. I, 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 my uncle Isaac, he owns a corner store, I know, uh, Sandra knows him well. Uh, there's something about a, a corner store and the interactions that you have with customers. You may not know about the innovation economy, but you certainly understand people. And I, I think that's at the heart of all of this. So uh, that's where I put, I put it. Isaac uh, and Panza on Main Street in Pataki. Okay. Lightning round. All right, Eric. Uh, I often go uh, for advice to my friend and neighbor, James Montero, who's a serial entrepreneur both in business and Nonprofit education, criminal, uh, criminal reform, uh, and I do, I do think it's worth giving a shout out to our nonprofits in this state, which are also a huge part of our economy, our culture, and our society. Uh, incredible things for us. Well, I have many, but I'll uh, one of them uh, is Jerry Lewis. Is, uh, his name, uh, it used to call uh, Kikeya Market on Royal Street, but now he changed it to some. And he really is an entrepreneur. He came from New York, he started his business, and now he's growing in most of the uh, United States with uh, a new business that he started. And Antonio is unbelievable. Thank you. I would hire a gentleman named Matt Moylan. He's from One Socket. Uh, he's a Salve Regina graduate. He is a helping to manage and run uh, two family-owned businesses, two restaurants in One Socket, Ciro's and Savini's Pomodoro. But not only that, he is a business consultant with his own business firm, and he helps rebuild businesses. But the most important thing is he's a human being. He's taken in many people within our city, 
and help them kind of turn their lives around. And that's the kind of people we need. All right, listen up carefully. The next one is, can each of you say something you admire about the candidate sitting to your left? And I'll start with Sabina. My left? Well, your left. Yeah. So this is easy because I have told her this before. I admire Stephanie, um, how the passion that she has, but how eloquent she is and when she speak, and um, I have told her this before, so it's not news. And then we're gonna go to Stephanie, keep it going, and then we'll come back. Uh, for uh, Mr. Carlson, I would say Meyer's ability to build wealth, and so that would be huge. I admire John's tenacity. I see him out stumping. Every time I'm out door knocking, I'm going to John. And I'm not out there all the time, so he must be out there all the time. So he's a pretty tough guy, and he's always wearing a suit, and he looks sharp. <laughs> well, I don't like anything about Stephen. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think he's a fantastic legislator at the state level. I've had an honor of being chair of state legislative affairs, and he's a stand-up guy. So thank you, Stephen. What I admire most about Anna Casada is her story of where she came from and her, her tenacity to never give up and fight to where she's got to. Well, I met Adam many years ago and one of the things that I really love is the passion that he has for politics and for organizing. So I'm going. Uh, I, I don't... Uh, I've worked with Gabe for many years. I think he's an incredibly effective person, and he's uh, got a way of building relationships with folks to, to get stuff done that I really respect and admire. Uh, I have so many nice things to say about Sandra because we often get sat next to one another, but I would just say her warmth. I mean, there is nobody, uh, with all respect to the other candidates, who I see on the trail who is more warm in her, her embrace, and I'm thankful uh, for that. Okay, Walter and I just met uh, recently, two months ago. And I think what I admire more about him is his sense of family as his foundation and also how kind he has been with me and always asks me about my kids. Thank you. I'm going to cry. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow, where do I start? I no, honestly, uh, half joking. I mean, uh, her sense of humor. Honestly, she's uh, she's pretty funny. We've had a couple laughs up here, uh, but I admire her sense of humor. All right. Well, that concludes our questions. I'm going to call up our colleague Oscar Mejia, who's just going to share a few closing remarks. I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone for coming here to the hub before Oscar makes. One. like that it's just wonderful in the world that we see today to have such you know to have laughter and you know such such warmth on the stage so thank you all for being here and, and taking the time well definitely has been a great great discussion so I want to say thank you to all the candidates and of course the start of the night our new moderators Lisa and Julie thank you very much for you very, very much. Definitely, when we heard the phrase, a small business at the backbone of the economy, is not just a phrase, it's a fact. And all the people who have been working with small business in the last 15 years knows that it's a fact, and it's a reality. And that backbone needs support. So, the economy in Rhode Island will be stronger if our business, including, of course, minority business that has access to capital, to training, to talent, and to network in order to grow. So I think that we are blessed to have this coalition of incredibly support, small business support organizations that we have been creating and working together to create a coalition between Open Main, Riva, Social Enterprise Greenhouse, Center for Southeast Asia, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, 
a model organization like CWE, like MIC, like Federal um, Fuerza Laboral, and other organizations around the state. And we keep working together for that. But here, I want to recall to be echo of something that we talk during the discussion, which is we need a champion in Congress for a small business. The next member of the Congress, the Congress need to be a champion for a small business and minority business. But, and I think that it's important to say, we need local champions. So the call for all the other nines to do not win the race, please stay involved with small businesses. Be the local champion for the small business. You have built a very, every one of you have built a very strong platform that could connect with other platforms that all those organizations are building to work together and to stand up for our small business, for our economic development, and for the social enterprise. So please, that is our call. This is not just our job. This is the job of all of us together, leaders, officials, organizations, business owners. If we can help other business owners, let's do it and let's work together. It's not that we need to give money. It's about share information. It's about give some recommendations. It's about to help others to access information. So please, our call is let's continue working together. So thank you all the organizations that work together to put this, uh, this forum. All the organizations and people who collaborate with the small business, thank you very much. I will um, encourage you to stay while doing networking and please vote with the conscious of select the best one because we need a champion in the Congress and we need local champions. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, there's drinks, there's food, and hope you have time to stay and talk with us for a little bit longer. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks, everyone.